Good evening. My name is Phyllis Wise, and I'm the provost here at the University of Washington, and I really want to welcome you to this series on early childhood development. The first speaker is actually what we consider the provost distinguished speaker, and that's Pat Cool. We started this series last fall because I felt that it was really critically important for us to recognize some of the more distinguished and internationally respected researchers and teachers on this campus. The Alumni Association embraced this idea and really has helped to sponsor this evening. And I think that many of you who are here are because of the wonderful marketing and advertising that they have done to let you know that we at the University of Washington welcome you back um, as alums. We welcome the faculty, staff, and students who are currently here every day. Tonight we are really privileged to have Pat Cool come and give the talk. She just came back from the University of Minnesota where she is an alum and received the most distinguished alum award. So not only the University of Washington recognizes her eminence, but her own college does. Um, Pat's work concentrates on early childhood learning and the acquisition of language. She studies it using very modern technologies and interactions with parents and children to try and learn what makes children acquiesce language at the time and early developmental periods that they do. She has received so many honors that if I really listed them, she wouldn't have any time to talk. So instead of doing that, what I'd really like to do is welcome you to this talk and invite Bill Gates to come and make a few comments. Bill, please. What a marvelous turnout. Great. Wonderful for all of you to be here, and I, I, I know you're going to enjoy it. Uh, it's easy to understand why there are so many of you here tonight. Early childhood and early childhood development is fundamentally important to all of us, and for good reason. It, it really is about our future. It's about the future of our country. Let me pose just a couple of relevant, I think, thoughts about the real-life implications of putting early learning programs into effect. One of the things we've learned in our programmatic research is that if you build it, they won't necessarily come. What I mean by that is that we can do great research and we can create the finest of programs to meet the needs of children and parents, all based on the best science but it's for naught if the only kids or parents who show up are those who have the least need for it. It's simply true that those troubled families for whose kids these programs are most critically important do not show up because of an announcement tacked up on a telephone pole. However, we've seen some successful models for getting all kids and parents involved. There's a guy in Harlem named Jeff Canada. He created an institution called the Children's Zone. And he's figured this piece out. He developed what he calls baby college for kids up to three years old and their parents. And the kids get to come play and learn, and the parents get taught about attachment talking with their children and other scientifically proven parental skills. It happens on a Saturday and is totally free to folks in Harlem. However, when Mr. Canada first started this program, no one came. He then deployed a cadre of folks to go knock on doors to tell people about the program and find out which homes had young children that would make them eligible for the program. This get the word out partially worked, but they still were only getting a small percentage of tending by those who were eligible and those who most needed it. So they decided to provide incentives for the parents to come, like free pampers or a free month's rent if you make it to all eight sections of the class. That got people into the baby college program 
and parents and kids are now getting the information and the help they need to succeed at that age for very little cost on Mr. Canada's part, whatever it takes. So as you listen to Dr. Cool, and as she shares with you tonight, think ahead to the implementation of this wisdom, and consider what we need to do to get all of our pre-kindergartners into these programs. Thank you again for coming tonight, and please join me in welcoming Professor Pat Cool to the stage. Good evening, everyone. I am really excited to be here to talk about early learning and the brain and the effect it's going to have on society. And I really want to thank Bill Gates. I think everyone in this room agrees that he is a state treasure. And we appreciate the work that he does for early learning. Thanks, Bill. And I also want to thank Provost Wise for the work that she's doing to support early learning on this campus and in the state. Well, tonight I want to talk to you about how children learn, uh, how learning changes the brain, and the impact of that information on society. There's been an enormous increase in discussions about early learning in the last decade. Now, why is that the case? I'll tell you tonight there are three important things that have changed that I think is bringing this uh, confluence about. The first is the academic world. The academic world has changed tremendously in the last decade. There's been a revolution in neuroscience. We can now observe an awake human brain while its owner is solving a problem, experiencing an emotion, or listening to a language. We can pinpoint in the brain very specific areas that are activated when particular tasks are undertaken. And new techniques allow us even to look at the growth of fiber tracks that allow areas of the brain to communicate with one another. And tonight, I'll tell you about some of the newest techniques that even allow us to measure the brain of a thinking, operating, alive, awake baby. So when I was a graduate student, none of this was possible. As a neurology intern at the University of Minnesota, I spent my Thursday mornings at 7 o'clock at autopsy. And the only way to look at a brain was to look at a dead brain of, of a person that I'd known and I had treated in aphasia therapy following a stroke. So looking at a dead brain and trying to discern something about the relationship between brain and language is a lot different than what my students are now doing. My students are going to be using all of these new tools to try to understand how the brain does its tricks. At the same time, business has changed. It's not only the academic community, but our software companies, like that little one across the lake, uh, are creating programs that aim to understand how people can interact with computers. One of the most important challenges that they face is to try to create a computer that can understand language, understand speech as we talk it, so that instead of using keystrokes to communicate with our computers, we actually talk to them through a microphone. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So computers are in this problem, this uh, artificial intelligence problem of understanding language, are taking some lessons from the work on babies and how they learn language. At the same time, we realize that children are using computers in ever-increasing um, numbers and at ever-decreasing ages. They use computers to play and to learn, and companies are attempting to create programs that are educational and interactive. So businesses are paying attention in general to the way that children learn. So if educational software can be created that helps children learn, that would be a good thing. Now, I also have to mention here that, that there are companies creating products for babies, DVDs that purport to improve your math skills, the baby's math skills, or improve their ability to acquire a second language. So we'll have a little bit to say about that before the evening ends. And then finally, society itself. You and I and all of us are changing because we're increasingly interested in children and how they learn. The editors of magazines like Life and Time and Newsweek tell us scientists that when they put a baby on the cover and they show the baby's brain, that those magazines sell out. 
uh, practitioners, parents, people on the front line, parents and educators, they want translation and, and dissemination of the newest findings. They're going partly to uh, magazines to learn what there is to know about what's happening in the scientific laboratories. I can also say that I think this began some 10 years ago. A White House conference um, that occurred 10 years ago this month, almost to the day, was organized by President Clinton and Hillary Clinton, and that's partly why we're here. I spoke at that conference about the new revolution in our notions of how babies learn and when babies learn, and all the neuroscience tools that were still then just on the horizon. And as this work was showcased, we started to talk about the implications for society and following at the governors of many states, including our own with Gary Locke and now Christine Gregoire, carried that information to their states so that everyone started to debate it. Education will certainly be high on the agenda in the 2008 presidential election, especially after today's announcement by Bill Gates and Eli Broad that they'll spend $60 million to put it front and center in the public's mind. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about four topics. The first is early learning. I'd like to explain a little bit about how early learning happens. Uh, and describe some of the techniques that show that babies learn in ways we never imagined. Their brains work computationally, but computation isn't all of it. It's, there's an amazing story to tell, so I'd like to impart some of that knowledge to you. The second thing I'll talk about is that we can now connect the dots between what you see in babyhood and what you see later in development. So I'll show you data tonight that uh, will convince you that a measurement taken on a baby at seven months of age, either with the brain measure or a behavioral measure, on the perception of the sounds of language will predict that baby's language skills out to the age of three. That's really an amazing scientific fact and it's also important for developmental disabilities. Third, I'm going to talk about the developing brain and discuss some of the reasons why babies are such good learners, why they can often learn better than we can, particularly in the case of language. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the ecosystem. Uh, Bill Sr. mentioned an ecosystem. All of the players in this ecosystem are important. So the basic research taking place in the laboratory informs public policy and it informs society. And both of those pieces of, of the puzzle uh, change what practices, change what parents do, and change what educators do in uh, classrooms. I want to also mention that here in the state of Washington, we have a very informed legislature. Uh, we have some members of the Washington State Legislature here tonight. They recently passed the Early Learning Bill, which is going to be extremely important in this state, has been and will be important in bringing about the, the right kind of programs so that all of our children can reach their potential. Now tonight I'm going to focus exclusively on language development and what it tells us about the brain. Language definitely has an impact on society. Success in school depends upon the use of language. And language, of course, and its acquisition is a major puzzle that's been debated for centuries by philosophers and psychologists and linguists. The world has over 6,000 languages, and infants can learn all of them. Tonight, we want to explore the mystery of this exclusively human trait and see what it uncovers not only about language, but about learning in general and how the baby brain works. So let me start with a graph, a graph that illustrates that there's a critical period for learning a language. Look at that curve. Isn't that interesting? That curve is good news for the babies and the children up to about seven, and not such good news for us. What you see is a curve describing the ability to acquire a second language. And we have age on the x-axis, and we have language score here on the y-axis, and higher is better. And what we're looking at is the skill shown by people of different ages when they attempt to learn a second language. As you can see from the graph, from babyhood to about the age of seven, you're really good at acquiring a second language. From seven to 10, you get a little bit worse. Uh, as you head towards 15, we're still, and uh, after puberty, we're really not very good at all. So for those of you in the audience trying to learn French or Spanish or Tagalog, 
Uh, the fact that you're struggling against your biology is to be expected. Now what I'll describe tonight is some theories about the critical period. One idea is that the critical period is age dependent. Something happens to learning mechanisms after puberty that do not allow you to learn in the way that you once did. Lenneberg thought it was the, the development of the corpus callosum. But what I'm going to argue is a, is a different view that it's learning itself. There's something very important going on in early development. The brain of the child is being committed. The neural networks are being committed to the properties of the native language. As that neural network grows and develops, it begins to provide interference for new languages. Because that neural network for English does not fit, is not appropriate for French or Japanese, the languages are different. So we're saying that early in development, this kind of learning that goes on, and I'll describe it as a kind of statistical learning, develops networks that will eventually make it more difficult for you to learn a second language. But I'll also tell you that some of the magic of learning in early childhood is now being applied in our laboratories to adults. And we can train old dogs new tricks if we use the right methods. We can learn also if some of the principles of early learning are applied to adults. So it's a very interesting thing to, um, to study. So in order to learn how babies are acquiring um, a language, we have to start with the very elemental units, the consonants and vowels that make up words. In order for you to learn words, you have to know what the units are that your language uses. So on this slide, we have a little bit of, of, of a lesson about the technicalities of speech. What you see on the top are two oral structures. On one side, the simple vowel ah, and on the other side, the simple vowel a. Ah. Look at those tongues. I'm outlining the tongue. So you can see that a simple maneuver of your tongue, you bunch it up in the back when you produce ah, and you flatten it when you produce a. Ah. So all of the sounds of language have characteristic postures. And these postures, when you look at the physics of sound, when you actually analyze the sounds, which we're doing at the bottom, left and right for ah and a, ah, you see that there are characteristic acoustic patterns that are produced. They're called formant frequencies, labeled here F1, F2, and F3. In order for you to track my speech, and I'm moving really fast, I'm not going ah, e, or a, ah, I'm producing very fast speech. So my formant frequencies are moving all over the place. And your auditory system is tracking them exquisitely. And that's what you have to do to be able to understand the differences between words and unpack sentences. Now, this sounds easy enough. The auditory system's excellent at formant tracking. Uh, but there's a lot of variety when each of us produces ah and ah. So let's listen to a group of speakers producing ah. 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 You can hear all this variability. They all are ahs, but there's a lot of variability. You can hear whether the person is old or young, male or female. Listen to those same speakers producing ah. 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 All right, a simple task. Lots of variability, but a simple task for a human ear, not a simple task for a computer. This is what the computer sees. When you actually analyze the acoustics, each one of these circles is the vowel produced in English. And inside the circle, each of those little symbols represents a particular talker. So when many talkers produce vowels, there's tons of variability. And look at the overlap. There's overlap all over. But this yellow area highlights the overlap for just two vowel categories. So if you're in that yellow area and you're a computer and you're analyzing the sounds, you cannot discern which of the two categories it belonged to. So computers fail at this basic level. Yet infants do not. How do they do it? Let's try to unpack how they do it. And more complicated still is the fact that this vowel space, this is considered the vowel space, this triangle, actually contains all the vowels of all languages. Swedish crowds 13 vowels into this space. Japanese only five. But in each case, the speakers of the language just mess them all up, and the categories are overlapping. So how is it that infants figure out which of the sounds their language uses and how to differentiate them? Well, we have our own tricks, and we've learned how to test babies all over the world 
on the sounds of many languages, the sounds of many, many languages. So this was a technique developed at the University of Washington, and I've used it to study speech sound perception in young infants across many countries. I have laboratories in Japan, in Taiwan, in Russia, Sweden, Fran France, Finland, Spain, and Mexico at the moment, and the students do a lot of traveling. We're using the sounds of all language to see which sounds babies initially hear, and then how does that change as they're bathed in a particular language. So let's watch a baby in this Can task. a baby as young as six months old hear the difference between two vowels? This baby is trained to look for the toy when the sound changes. She's being distracted, so she'll turn only when she hears the difference in sounds. Ah. Uh. The key question, will she turn before the toy lights up? Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. E. 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 I think she's really enjoying herself. Infants can be trained in this task in about 20 trials, and if you do this work all over the world with the sounds of many languages, you make the following discovery. Until about six months of age, babies are what we like to call citizens of the world, meaning they can discriminate the sounds of all languages. It doesn't matter whether they come from Tagalog, French, Russian, or the languages of Papua New Guinea. They can hear all of these distinctions. And that's surprising because you and I cannot. We are simply not able to do that. As adult speakers of one or two languages, we discern the sound differences that are critical to our language, but find it very difficult to discriminate those from other languages. We're not good at discriminating the sounds of Mandarin Chinese or the sounds of Spanish. And Japanese adults have a terrible time with the sounds R and L, like in rid and lid, because the Japanese language doesn't distinguish them. So a question arises about development. When, in development, do children change from that citizen of the world status they started as to the culture-bound listeners we now are? And the answer is extremely early before their first birthdays. So here are the data. This is the result of a study done in Japan and here in Seattle on the perception of ra and la in that simple head turn technique. We're measuring babies at two ages, six to eight months and 10 to 12 months. You see these two dots for American infants and Japanese infants at six to eight months. They're equivalently good, about 65% correct. Now, two months later, look what happens. American babies get a lot better at this RL distinction. Japanese babies get a lot worse. So something's happening at that critical period in development right here. On one side of that line, they're citizens of the world. On the other side of that line, they're culture-bound listeners. So why at that particular time, and what's causing that change in their, in their development? What I'm going to tell you is that at this particular time in the infant's development, the babies are actually taking statistics on the input that they hear. So that mess of vowels I showed you in the um, vowel triangle previously, what babies are doing is listening to the vowels and figuring out by doing a kind of distributional frequency analysis where the hot spots are. Where is it that most of the vowels occur in this language? So let's pretend you're Swedish. If you're a Swedish infant, you're listening to Swedish and you discover by your distributional statistical analysis that the, babe, that the, the people talking to you are spending a lot of time in these hot spots. You hear a lot of sounds that are falling right in this frequency domain, but these F1, F2 coordinate spaces. And in this short period of time, babies begin to develop categories that center themselves on these spots in space where the most popular, you know, where speakers are really spending a lot of time. If you're Japanese, you're doing the same thing, but with five vowels in your language, developing those categories that were going to start to restrict your ability to hear distinctions. If you're an American baby listening to English, you're beginning to organize categories eight of them that are appropriate for English based on what you hear. Now, once these categories are formed, babies stop attending to contrasts that aren't important. Meaning, in Japan, where babies are hearing R and L all belong to one category, there's a central R vowel that's midway between English R and L, that category collapses. They no longer 
pay attention to the distinction between English L and R because it's not important to Japanese. So they're actually computing, we've shown in the laboratory, that a short-term exposure to statistical distributions cause infant learning. And this is the kind of thing that they're doing as they acquire that first stage in language development. When the New York Times heard that babies were taking statistics on the basis of what they heard us say, they drew this cartoon showing babies across continents with little nets in their hands. They're netting sounds that are in the air and it's altering their brains. And the caption said, baby brains are taking statistics as we speak. It was a very surprising finding because no one predicted that infants at this six, as early as six months had begun to organize input in this way. And it made us all ask the question, well, what are the babies listening to? What, what are they paying attention to? And the answer that, to that is they're paying attention to us and the very special kind of language we use when we talk to infants and young children. It's illustrated here. The signal's been variously called motherese, fatherese, parentese, and very politically correctly, caretaker ease. <laughs> As it turns out, you don't have to be a parent to speak this kind of language. Uh, you just have to be in front of a baby or a young child. What you see here is a plot of the pitch of the voice in an AD condition, adult-directed condition, and an ID condi condition, infant-directed. And we have a mother in the laboratory, and she's talking to me. She's talking to me, and then she's talking to her, uh, the baby, two-monther, sitting on her lap. And when she talks to an adult, she has a regular pitch contour like, a, like I'm speaking to you tonight. I had a little, I had a little bit, and uh, the doctor gave me bendectin for it. It's not uninteresting, but it's not going very far, right? Pretty flat. But then she turns to her two-month-old baby who's sitting on her lap, and she says, can you say, ah? Say, ah. Hey, you. Say, hi. Hi. I mean, you know, I can't do that without a baby in my, my hands. But the mothers and the fathers and all parents and all caretakers can, can do that. It's not your job interview voice, right? <laughs> not your job interview voice. But babies love it. If you give them a choice in the laboratory by little head turns to the right or to the left that will turn on motherese or women producing adult-directed speech, they'll do whatever they have to do to turn on mothers talking to babies. And they aren't their own mothers. So, we asked, does it have any value for babies? Now, you can see by this, in this plot that when we speak motherese, we slow down speech. And that causes us to articulate better. We actually produced cleaner, a purer signal, more prototypic signal in motherese than during uh, the conversation, the rapid conversation we have with other adults. In 1997, we made the discovery that um, when you actually analyze the vowel sounds in three different languages, in English, Russian, and Swedish, this is a group of mothers in each of these countries, that the blue triangle, this is in vowel space, this is the locations of the E, A, and U vowels in the blue triangle when we speak to other adults. And the red triangle is the uh, acoustic analysis of the sounds we produce in motheries. So what you can see is we're stretching the space. We're actually making it easier for babies to take statistics because we've extended the distributions. You over-articulate because you're speaking slowly. You speak clearly. It actually cleans up the language because it's more articulate from a sentence perspective. It has uh, clearer words, and the sounds themselves are like little nuggets that the uh, child can use to map the brain at that particular period in development. We've learned that this stretching of the vowel space is extremely good, even for adults learning a foreign language. So in Japan now, we're looking at adults trying to teach them English. They have never been exposed to English before. It actually helps. The high pitch isn't, isn't particularly relevant to an adult, adult Japanese speaker, but the stretching of the vowels is extremely important. It helps them, we think, uh, get around the neural machinery they've developed for Japanese and to deal with English. So to recap thus far, I've said that infants take statistics as they listen to us and that the stretching of the sounds that we do in motherese is good for them. 
that babies like to listen to it. And I should mention here that children with autism, unfortunately, do not. Children with autism given a choice between a mother signal and a computer non-speech analog of that signal will turn on the non-speech computer analog all of the time. And the more they turn it on, the more they like it, the more severe their symptoms of autism, the poorer their language skills, and the poorer their cognitive skills. So it may be, the exciting news about that is that since this particular uh, preference test can be administered as young as 15 weeks of age, it shows some promise with regard to the uh, use of these kinds of basic measures of speech processing early in development. So I want to um, demonstrate now, we have said so far how important this early learning is and that we think that it's the kind of thing that should allow us to predict a baby's language skills. So how, how do we take measures that could predict future language skills? Well, here's a demonstration of one of our techniques. Uh, this is a baby wearing a nylon cap, light as a feather, and inside the nylon cap are sensors that measure the electrical activity that escapes, it leaks, uh, from the scalp as the baby's doing something, uh, as they listen to a language. These EEG recordings uh, you amplify the signals coming from the scalp through the sensors, and you can see and analyze the signature neural uh, correlates of particular kinds of things that infants can do. So there is a particular neural signature that measures the ability to hear a sound change, uh, just like in our head turn task when we're going from ba to pa or from a to e. These neural signatures can be identified that show uh, when the baby is responding to a distinction. So what we did was to take these brain measures on babies at seven and a half months, and then we brought babies back into the laboratory for language analysis at 14 months, 18 months, 24 months, and 30 months. And our question was, is there ability and interest in the sounds of language early in development at seven and a half months? does that predict the degree and rate of growth, the degree of skill in language and the rate of growth? And the answer is that it, it does. But there are two important discoveries. The first one is illustrated on this slide. Now, this is a correlation slide, so let's go through it so that you can follow it. The bottom line is the slide illustrates that as native language learning begins at around 7.5 months, foreign language abilities decline in individual babies. So we're plotting on this axis native language, la na native discrimination ability. And on this axis, foreign discrimination ability. And each dot here, each square, is an individual baby. So what you see is that babies who are really good at seven and a half months at native language discrimination are comparably poor at foreign. It's like the learning process itself has them declining on the alternate possibilities. As you map your brain for English, in a sense, you're attending less. You're giving up Japanese and French unless you're being exposed to it. So this is related to the critical period idea that I advanced before. We think that it's learning itself that changes the brain that causes this decline in foreign language abilities. So that was our first discovery, that the children who are advancing faster uh, on native language are declining faster on their foreign language abilities. But the second question was, does this early measure predict later language? Can we show that your skill at seven and a half months predicts your ability way out in the second and third year of life? And the answer is that it is possible to do that. And here are the data. So here we're plotting the correlation between 24-month-old's words produced. So on this axis, we're showing the number of words produced. And on this axis, we're showing their skill as measured by the brain uh, test. You can see a very strong positive correlation. Babies who are better, they're on the good end, of the brain measure assessment are also producing many more words. The, the best babies are producing nearly 600 words at 24 months, 
whereas those who had trouble in the phonetic perception test, the sound tests, are producing a whole lot less. So better perception is equal to faster language growth. And the same thing is true if you look at sentence complexity. So the better babies were at seven and a half months, the more complex their sentences at 24 months are. And the same is true at 30 months if you measure the mean length of their utterances. Mean length of utterances is another measure of, of their knowledge of language. So the ability to predict uh, can be done at seven and a half months. There's continuity between early development and later language. Again, very important for diagnosing potential language problems. Now, here's another interesting um, uh, fact that we found in this study. We tested the babies, same age, same techniques with a native language sound and a foreign language sound. Native language learning predicts future language. But we said, according to this theory we had, that the baby's brain is, is committing itself to native language, that if you tested babies at seven and a half months with a foreign language sound, it should not produce that same kind of positive correlation. It should do a, a different pattern. Because babies who at seven and a half months remain good at foreign language discrimination are still in phase one, the phase where all the sounds of all languages are equivalent. And in fact, what we saw was exactly matching that prediction. Non-native perception at seven and a half months also predicts future language, but in the opposite direction. Here we show that the better um, word producers up here in the corner are ones who have poorer non-native abilities. And children who are better at non-native sound discrimination have fewer words, meaning these children are gaining language more slowly they're still in phase one. They're still treating all the sounds of all languages as I, I, identical. When learning ensues, when neural commitment begins, babies advance towards language. And again, we see that same pattern with sentence complexity, a negative correlation, and that same pattern with MLU, the mean length of utterance. So it's the first time this has been demonstrated. One, that you can predict language abilities by a simple measure at seven and a half months and that non-native speech predicts the opposite direction. It's a way of measuring when do babies take off on that process of learning. And some are doing it more quickly than others. We don't know exactly why, but we're trying to pursue that in studies now. So again, I've said this important period in development is something we should pay attention to. If infants are capable of taking statistics on language input at this point in development, we should be able to induce learning in the laboratory of a foreign language if we present the foreign language at the right time. So we set out to do that in the laboratory with Mandarin Chinese. Now, we had done studies in Taiwan and the United States that showed, just like the Japanese and American babies perceiving RNL, that Taiwanese babies and American babies at six to eight months behave identically uh, with regard to this the, uh, contrast that's important for Mandarin Chinese but not important for English, the, I call it Xi Xi because that's how I hear it. The Mandarin graduate students tell me, no, no, Dr. Cool, those two are as different as night and day. They're just like Ra and La, but to me, they are Xi Xi. So we tested the babies in Taiwan and the United States. At six to eight months, they are equivalently good. Two months later, the Taiwanese get a lot better and the American babies get a lot worse. Now here was our question. What if we bathe American babies in the Mandarin Chinese? We present them with 12 sessions, 25 minutes each, and present them with four different talkers over those 12 sessions, and they hear a lot of syllables. They get 33,000 syllables on average, allowing them to take lots of statistics. If, they, if this is a critical period in development, then exposure to Mandarin should cause them to learn. So these are what the sessions looked like as we ran them with babies in the laboratory. Jasper, Zalan Fim. Hi, we're going to talk about a story. Today, we're going to talk about the story of the Xiao Xiong Chichi Tanxian Ji. Let's see what happened. The Xiao Xiong Chichi is here. Good. Oh, there was a day that the Xiao Xiong Chichi said, now, are you learning any Mandarin yet? <laughs> okay, look how attentive the babies are. May certainly has their attention in this little task. 
，绿色的圈圈，转一下，转一圈，嘿，一圈，再一次哦，转一，一，二，三，两个圈，再一个，一，二，三 ，OK。Now, as a scientist, you also have to run a control group, right? So we brought another group of American babies in, same age, same number of sessions, but this time they listened to the, uh, the American-speaking, English-speaking graduate students. So one group were brought in and took turns listening to the Mandarin-speaking graduate students, and the control group heard the English-speaking graduate students. Our question was, did infants learn? So after exposure, all the babies in the control group and in the Mandarin exposure group were tested on this she-she contrast and compared against these data that I'd shown you before. So the question is, what did they learn through these exposure sessions? Well, the good news is the control group didn't learn anything. Uh, as a scientist, you really want to make sure that just coming into the laboratory did not improve the baby's Mandarin skills. And indeed, it did not. So we were happy about that, thank goodness. And so let's look at what the babies who were exposed to Mandarin for 12 sessions did in their follow-up tests. The babies exposed to Mandarin for 12 sessions are statistically identical to the babies growing up in Taiwan who had listened for 10 months by that time. So these data showed that no matter what language you put in front of the babies at this point in development, they can take the statistics. 33,000 syllables over four talkers over this period of time is sufficient. And that's quite amazing. It certainly supports the idea that this is a critical period in development for this kind of, of uh, data analysis on the part of the, of the baby brain. But it made us wonder whether or not the human being in this task was essential. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have a basement full of tapes, audio tapes and videotapes from companies who are trying to get my endorsement with regard to saying that babies can learn French from a DVD. And I don't know if they can learn French from a DVD, so we decided that we should test it in the laboratory. So we brought in a film crew, and we filmed the speakers, the Mandarin speakers, exposing the babies to the language, made these beautiful DVDs, so good that the graduate students thought that the babies might outperform the live group by watching the DVDs because they were so clear. We also had another group come in and just listen to audio. So they were looking at a colorful bear on the screen, but they heard the equivalent of an audio tape of this foreign language. Same amount of time, same time in development, same tests following. Did they learn? language from TV or audio. Well, let's see. Let's look at the audio group first. Bring that data point in. Absolutely no learning from audio tape at this time uh, in development when presented in that way. Well, you would think that the television with the audio visual being so captivating uh, would produce learning, but here are the data for the kids in the TV condition. So there was no learning whatsoever from either a DVD or an audio tape. You might as well have been in the control group not hearing a single syllable of Mandarin. So it's very interesting that social interaction is important in this learning process. We know babies are taking the statistics. Many experiments, mine included, uh, demonstrated this. But it appears from this result that the social brain might gate the computational mechanisms of learning. The social brain determines when it's worth taking statistics on. So, and that's actually helpful. Why have babies take routine statistics on everything in the environment? That would be a waste of their precious brain resources. Having the social brain direct computational learning seems to be a very good idea. But it's important that we understand it, that this is how learning works in the early period. We've now undertaken with our colleagues in the College of Education, funded by the NSF uh, Life Center here at the University of Washington, we're exposing babies to Spanish and taking very sophisticated films of the babies interacting with their tutors. So we can ask the question, do babies' social interaction skills predict how much they're going to learn from exposure to a foreign language? Here's what these sessions look like. Te dan besito. Besito, porque te quiere, ¿no? 
con la boca, te da un besito. Mmm, qué rico es el pan. Muchas gracias, Lucas. Mía. Dos, tres. Hola, ¿cómo estás? ¿Estás bien, Spencer? ¿Te gusta el pan? ¡Qué rico! Ok. So the first thing we've shown, these are studies in progress, but I can give you some preliminary results. Uh, these studies are showing first that babies learn Spanish as well as they learn Mandarin. Not only the phonetic units of the language, but there's some indication that they're learning the words. And we can now say that both uh, measures of social interaction that we're taking, both the at overall attention measures and their tendency to look back and forth between Diego or the other Spanish tutors and the toy. They're using people as a kind of social reference. The degree to which they do those two things predicts the degree to which their abilities show an increase uh, from exposure. So the social brain does seem to have something to do with our ability to acquire language. Moreover, our studies, preliminary analysis only, is showing that this experience improves babies' cognitive skills. Not all of them. We're not making them smarter. But particular skills having to do with executive function and the direction of attention is actually improved during this 12-session exposure. It's an amazing set of findings. Oh, the power of early learning. Well, as we head to the future, what we're interested in is tracking the activity. This is where the action is, at the neuronal level. But it isn't any one cell that's doing the work. It's millions of cells working in concert. We need devices, tools of systems neuroscience, that allow us to look at whole, you know, whole groups of neurons working together. And if you're interested in humans rather than frogs or fruit flies, you need the kinds of machines that allow you to do uh, systems analysis of whole brains at a time. Here at the University of Washington, we're laying the path for an investment in baby MEG. MEG stands for magnetoencephalography in a center for child brain imaging. It'll be the first of its kind in the nation. And I want to show you what this device will allow us to do. Here is the newest device in Helsinki, Finland. It looks like a hair dryer. And it is a noiseless, safe, harmless, non-invasive uh, analysis in the uh, device where 306 sensors are measuring neuromagnetic fields as the neurons do their work. These sensors are located in the helmet that the head is um, tucked into. And the sensors deliver information on a millisecond and millimeter basis to a bank of computers. It is truly an engineer's um, dream. Uh, we have at our laboratories Toshi Yamada uh, from Japan, one of the world's five best MEG technicians. And he is showing us the patterns that we can produce from this particular work. Now, of course, we at the University of Washington don't yet have one. Uh, so we are sending Toshi to Helsinki to Taipei and to Tokyo to do these studies. But we will have a machine here at the University of Washington. The beauty of it is that you can test babies. This is six-monther Emma in Helsinki. She's listening through little insert earphones to the sounds of her native language Finnish and foreign languages. I've turned the sound off so you can just witness how quiet this device is, as opposed to something like fMRI, which produces about 100 decibels of noise, and you can only, the youngest children that can be tested in an fMRI device are five. Now, Emma's very entertained there. She's very interested in the sounds that she's hearing, and she's also interested in the activities that she's watching. So uh, what are we having her watch? Well, she's watching Denise. Denise is lab manager extraordinaire, whose abilities to attract infants with her endless maneuvers with toys uh, is really quite extraordinary. So this allows us to test babies uh, that are from <laughs> the earliest periods in development uh, until adulthood. It's the same device, same technique, same sounds, and we can examine learning in adults and in babies using this particular device. <laughs> she has many tricks. 
So here's what the end result is. You record uh, data from 306 channels, and in the first study demonstrating the feasibility and the kinds of studies that we are going to be able to do, we demonstrated an interesting change in newborns, six-monthers, and 12-monthers. What you see here is a newborn brain. We're looking here on the left at the auditory areas, here on the right at the motor areas, Broca's area, which is responsible for the production of speech. And at the bottom, we're looking at the timing of activation. In order to learn to talk, you have to connect the auditory areas of the brain and the motor areas of the brain. As you can see in the newborn listening to speech, auditory areas are very active, uh, but the uh, motor areas are not. As we move towards six months, something has changed. The auditory areas, when you hear a syllable like ba or ta, are very activated in the auditory arena. But also, Broca's area, the motor area, begins to light up. And there's synchrony between these two activations. Same thing is true, and even more strongly, at 12 months. The beauty of the technique is that you can see brain areas interacting with, other, with each other and the temporal synchrony that's involved. So it's going to be very, very interesting to watch development with this kind of method. Now I want to begin closing by saying, to point out this particular article that was written in the New York Times Magazine recently, asking what will it really take to close the education gap? The article is remarking that many children are still left behind and that when you try to repair things to close that preparation gap in school, it's too late. And that really to close the preparation gap, you're going to have to start a lot earlier when learning is so very important. As we've seen tonight, babies are taking statistics. Their social brains are controlling when they do so. Uh, our studies, not yet ready for prime time, are demonstrating that there's a big difference in the brain of a child who's not had the learning opportunities that others have had. These studies, I think, will demonstrate how very important it is that we pay attention that we level the playing field, that all children have adequate uh, opportunity to learn by giving the experiences that they need. Fifty years from now, we won't be judged by the children who succeed, but probably by the children who we left behind. So it's very important that this information uh, be understood, that we really see what environments are doing to alter the brain, and that we move towards the field of genetics so that we can combine the study of the environment, the study of genetics, the study of the skill set, and the study of the brain. The final thing I want to show you tonight is a little experiment. I've been talking all evening about how children learn automatically. They learn simply by existing in the environment. We don't have to do anything to cause them to learn. Their brains automatically soak up the information. In this little experiment, I'm going to convince you that you hear with your eyes as well as your ears. So I'm going to show you a little movie, and the movie is a dubbed movie. Through your eyes, you're going to be watching the syllable gaga. But your ears are going to get something totally different, baba. So it's like watching a movie in Japan, and you're seeing John Wayne, and he's saying what he's supposed to say, you imagine, but out of his lips are coming Japanese. And it's such a funny experience to watch those lips and sounds that don't match. So what I'm going to have you do is listen with your eyes closed to see what it is that you hear in the absence of any visual information. And then open your eyes to see if it changes when your visual system gets the information. If you behave like the subjects in my experiment, with your eyes closed, you'll hear something like baba. But when you open your eyes, it turns into something like da da. Here we go. Okay, Close here your we eyes. go. Baba, 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 Baba. Okay, open up. Baba, Baba, Baba. Open and close. Baba. See if you can make it go away. Baba, Baba, Baba. Baba, 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 
Okay, that's it. I hope it worked. Okay, raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand if it changed when you opened your eyes. Oh, it worked. Uh, if it didn't, see me later. It's probably something wrong with your brain. <laughs> we also know that this starts early in development because if you do an experiment in which you show babies two faces, one producing silently, one producing silently, and they're both moving together, and you turn on a sound in the middle of the two faces that matches one of them. So babies, some of the babies hear, ah, ah, and some of the babies hear, e, e, but the sound is coming from the middle. And then you watch their eyes when you turn on the sound. The babies who hear, ah, fixate the mouth that's going, ah. And the babies who hear E fixate the sound that's going, the face that's going. So they can lip read. They can do something akin to lip reading. And they're only 18 weeks old. So babies are learning by both listening to us and watching us. It's quite an incredible demonstration of the effects of early learning. Here's the summary. How do children's brains work? Well, the brain is a computer. The baby has a computer between its shoulders. But that computation is modulated by their very sophisticated social brains. It's something we need to take into account as we think about their education. Infants are born learning. We should start foreign language instruction early if we value it, not in high school. In high school, you're fighting their biology. Third, phonetic learning is a pathway to language. Uh, we can show that early measures predict later outcomes, and that's very important for reading and disabilities. Fourth, the preparation gap at first grade may be due to reduced learning opportunities in early development. And fifth, new neuroscience tools, MEG, will greatly affect research in the next decade. And finally, just remember, we're all part of the ecosystem. We're in this together for the sake of our children. So let's work together, have a good time, and produce the best outcomes for all of our children. This is a lab group and collaborators. It takes an army. It takes an army to do this research. And the army has to be interdisciplinary and um, international. Uh, collaborators span all disciplines. I thank them very much. And I also thank all of the people who support this research. It, too, requires a lot of resources. Thank you very much.